Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning for another word from the Lord. Um, we're going to start off a prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning thanking you for health, for strength, thanking you for clarity of our thoughts, Lord God. We thank you that no weapon formed against us can prosper. And that we, when we obey your word, Father God, that you are there to help us, Father God, to assist us as we move forth in the things that you have given us to do. Father, it's our heart's desire to serve you and to be pleasing in your sight, Lord God. So we thank you this morning that as this word goes forth, it will find good soil to land on, Father God, and produce fruit that is pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, the title of this morning's message is, Don't Become a Faithful Churchgoer. That sounds kind of like, wow, I see my husband's eyes when I said that. So I'll say it again. Don't become a faithful churchgoer. The title that the Lord gave me for this message is supposed to be shocking. And it's supposed to cause mature saints to be pricked. So now I have my disclaimer, which is this is not an anti-church message. Because the brick and mortar building has a purpose, but many have confused and mistaught about its function and purpose, and so therefore it's been misused. So the brick and mortar church has a purpose, but its purpose is not to stay there forever. So, this message is going to bring clarity using scriptures and visual demonstrations. So to start off, I'm going to show you a video, very short clip. That was super quick, and I'm hoping that you were able to see it clearly. That was a beautiful little girl learning to walk, and her father was extending his hand to her, encouraging her to come to him. So, when many of us think about stepping out into God's assignments and what he's called us to do, into unknown territory because that little girl didn't know anything, right? This is her first little steps. So to her, that's like, wow, this is incredible. But she's trusting the hand of her father, right? So how many times do we, when God is calling us to come to him, we concentrate on the fall of messing up part. But when you saw that video, the father, when the baby, she took two steps and then she fell. But his face, he was smiling from ear to ear. Why was that? Because she took a faith, a leap of faith. That's right. Because she took a step of faith. He did not look at the fact that, okay, she didn't make it this time. She's not like walking and running like an adult. His joy was in the fact that she trusted him enough to try. And that's what God is calling us to do. When we become trained, when we become filled with what God wants to give us, he's, he's glorified, he's happy, 
when we decide to step out into unknown territory, trusting in his hand, not staying stuck thinking about what if I fall? What if I don't do it perfect? Because the father's not looking at that. He's looking at the trust factor, the faith level that we have, right? I'm going to be looking down at my notes periodically to make sure I'm on track with what the Lord gave me. And the fan is blowing. So one note went down, but that's okay. I finished with that one. So the father didn't judge the number of steps his daughter made, right? He didn't judge the fall that she made. He rejoiced over the faith steps that she made. That is a daughter and a son that trusts in the Lord. We say, okay, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it on the first try. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But if God is calling me to do something, I'm going to try. And if I'm leaning on him, God never fails, right? Right. As long as I'm being obedient to his word and I'm allowing myself to be filled with the nutrients, with the feeding of the nutrients and the food that he needs to put in me, to sustain me as I go forth, I'll make it. Right? Right. You have to be equipped first. So now, after seeing that video, I'm going to ask you a multiple choice question. And you choose either A or B. And choose loudly so I can hear you. A. The father's desire in that video is that the daughter will always stay at that stage and never be able to walk without him. That's A. Or B. The father's desire is that his daughter will learn from him and get to the stage where she can walk without his help. B. B. I heard one B. Do I have another B? Yeah, B. Yeah, B. Okay. That's right. So I'm going to take it for granted that even the people that are looking at this video picked B. So now we're going to take it a step further. As the daughter continues to grow and she learns how to walk, and then she learns how to feed herself and she matures. How many think the father's desire is going to change then to where he desires her to be able to leave his home and live independently? Is that a fair yes. assumption? Yes. That as we have our children and we begin to nurture them, our desire is that one day they will leave us, even if it hurts, because they do not belong to us, right? We all have been given assignments by God that must be fulfilled. And in order to fulfill the assignment, you have to go. Okay. Now with that said, what would you say about a father who did everything in his power to make sure his daughter was never ready to leave him and could never live on her own? How would you describe that father that was, he made sure that- It was awful father. Awful. Any, any other comments? What would you think about a father who made sure that what he put in his children was just enough to make sure they would always need him and never be able to stand on their own? Wow. How many of you would like that kind of dad? No. Clothe you? Feed you? Provide you with shelter? but never give you enough to leave. And if you leave, 
he'll see it as a betrayal. So he's given you everything to sustain you physically, right? right? You got a roof over your head, you got clothes on your back, you got food in your stomach, but you're never given the skills and the training that you need to leave. You're a hostage. That's right. You want to keep control. You're raising a hostage. Okay. So now comes the analogy to the brick and mortar churches under the leadership of self-called pastors. Self-called. This is directed towards self-called pastors that is very important because this is not to say God ordained pastors are excluded from this that know their true calling and mission but those that have called themselves and are looking for hostages is directed towards them Raising up people that will never be strong enough to leave them. So let's define church. I'm going to do that by using a quote from a paragraph off of a website called The Christian Crier. Okay? And it says, what is the Bible definition of church? The word church in the Bible comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means a called out company or assembly. Wherever it is used in the Bible, it refers to people throughout scripture. So scripturally, church is referring to people, not a building. Okay. So to further support this, we know that we are called to study the word ourselves, right? To show ourselves approved, rightfully dividing the word of truth. So I'm going to give you some scriptures to write down that you can further investigate this on your private time to get it into your spirit. Because I can tell you but you need to know it for yourself, right? God is calling for that in this day and age. He wants us to study to show ourselves approved. Not depend on the words of any flesh. So the word church is used three different ways in scripture. So hopefully you have your pen and your paper and you write down these scriptures so that you can learn. The church is defined as a local assembly or group of believers. That's the first one. And those scriptures are 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 1. Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The second way it's used is defined as the body of individual living believers. And those scriptures are 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 9. Galatians chapter 1 verse 13 and finally the third way it's used in the scripture is as the universal group of all people who have trusted Christ through the ages and those scriptures are Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 and Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 through 27. 
So, go and study so that you can reinforce the word that was given that the church is a people. So there is no biblical dispute that the church is not a building. They may be many of our own fleshly disputes, but as according to scripture, there is no foundation to stand on to dispute that the church is not a building. The church of God, us, the body, we his people, as we gather ourselves together, when we come together, the Lord's presence meets us there. So, we the church, we gather ourselves together, God's presence comes in, he dwells with us because wherever two or more are gathered, he's in the midst. And so he is there with us, and that is the church gathering wherever we meet, whether it be in a building or outside of a building. The church is the gathering of us, not the building. So this morning, there are three of us where this is church. Legitimate, scriptural, this is church. We are gathering, and he is in the midst, and he is dwelling with us. We're having church. Close down all the buildings you want. The church is alive and thriving. We're having church. We are the church. Now, as we gather ourselves together, there is structure, there is order, and there is love. Not many places brick and mortar can say that. There is structure, there is order, and there is love. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13 says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, those gifts are here. They're in operation. They are used in more places than just a church building. And those callings, one person can have all five. One person may have three. One person may have two. This does not mean that you have to have five different people. Because there could be, and I do know, five-fold ministry gifts that are functioning in all five areas. So now, within that scripture was the word pastor. So let's, what is a pastor? Pastor, the Hebrew word is roah, to tend a pasture. And the Greek one is poman, and that means a shepherd. And they have the verb, verb form is pomiano, which is to feed. So pastor is roah, to tend a pasture. The Greek is Pomen to shepherd, and the verb form in Greek is pomano, which is to feed. So they're attending the pasture, they're shepherding, and they're feeding, right? 
Is that right? Yes. Okay. So the point here is that the pastor's job is to feed, not to rule over or control. And many have gotten that mixed up. This is my house. I set the rules. You do what I say. Because this is my church. Your job is to feed the flock. Not to rule and control the flock. Pastors are to give themselves over to studying the word to provide spiritual nourishment to those they are feeding with the intention that those they are feeding will eventually get to the stage where they can feed themselves and no longer need them. And that's where you have the problem come in. Because so many want to keep feeding. You can't feed yourself. I need to give you this. That's not God's intention for the pastor. That's not part of the calling of the pastor to make you handicapped that you constantly need them in order to fulfill the call that God has placed on your life because everyone has a calling. Everyone has an assignment. That's why you are breathing this morning because God has an assignment for you to fulfill. So as we leave, as we mature, what do we do? If you came from a healthy church building with a God-ordained pastor, what you would then do is when you leave into your assignment and you find babies that are birthed into the kingdom, you send them there. I know a place where you can go and be fed and nourished properly so that you too can leave. Not sit there for years and years and years. That is the purpose. Are you seeing the connection of the church building, the brick and mortar? Yes. The purpose yes. for the harvest? Not for mature Christians to just sit there day in and day out? Okay. It's a cycle. So pastors, don't get too attached to the flock because God's sheep are supposed to be trained and released. They don't belong to you. You hear that all the time and it, we, we take it very lightly. You know, my congregation, my people, we're God's people. We don't belong to any man, right? But we, we got so used to saying it. You know, my congregation. You don't have a congregation, really. What do you think about that, pastors? You're shepherding God's congregation. You're stewards over God's people. None of them belong to you. So if you're a true pastor and a spiritual father, you will never try to, spirit, to, to make spiritually mature people feel guilty about growing and going. Right? Amen? Amen. If you are a God-ordained pastor called by God that you did not place yourself in office, that you are a true shepherd with God's heart, after you feed the people, you will be confident, you will be overjoyed when you release them and see them functioning and prospering in their gifts and their assignment, independent of you. That's a true shepherd. You won't talk about them badly because they left. Oh, so-and-so left the ministry. You know they ain't right. You won't do that. You won't lie to them and tell them 
that in order to be covered by you, they have to sit in your church every Sunday. Hello, somebody. That you, you won't lie to them. You won't manipulate them into thinking that they got to sit under you in order to be covered by you. Because if you are a true man of God called to be a pastor, you will cover them wherever they are. You will cover them wherever they go. You will cover them when they move out in the assignment that God has called them to because you are a loving, compassionate shepherd with the heart of God. You are not holding prisoners and hostages in your church building. So what God is saying is that this is not a shepherding spirit, it's a controlling spirit. It is a sick practice that is being called loyalty and faithfulness to your pastor. Wow. This is not re rebellion time, it's not revolt time, it's not disobedience time, it's letting you know that there is a time to be sitting under a shepherd and to be fed by that shepherd. But when the time comes that you recognize and learn God's voice and he tells you to leave, you leave. You don't continue to sit there. Okay? And I'm speaking about moving. And God wanted me to point this out specifically that this is not talking about emotional moves. Okay, so if you're a person that's easily offended and you've got attitude, this is not about you. I'm not, the Lord is not directing this towards you. He's directing this towards people that he has told to leave. Not because you got offended or you don't like somebody. That's a whole different thing. You still need training if that's how you plan to move. Okay, you're not mature if you're moving because you got an attitude. Okay, that's not the mature saints that God is talking about. We're talking about saints that hear his voice and are obeying him by moving, in, moving out into what he is saying. Okay? So make that clear. If you're listening to this voice and you're hearing these words and you say, oh, wow, I know I can leave now because I don't like, this is not, no, no, no. You need to stay because you need to be trained Okay, this is not for you. This is not a get out the church easy pass. Okay, this is speaking to people that are mature enough and are listening to God's voice. So now I'm going to, okay, I'm going to just say a person's name right now. She's going to know exactly who. Because I told her, when I saw her post, Lady A, this is you, sis. You're mature. I know you know God. And you heard his voice and you moved. And I, I, I congratulate you on that. That no matter what feelings, no matter what doubt, whatever, no matter if it was guilt trying to come on you, you stepped out because you heard God. And that's what we have to know. We're not following flesh and emotions. We're following the voice of our Father. A stranger's voice we will not follow. So now I'm going to show you a visual. Where's my tablet, Moses? If it's in the room, run and get it because I need to show something. Thank you. I thought I had everything prepared and set before me, but that is something that got away from me. So that's all right. We'll wait a few minutes and so I can show this picture. Amen. Open that up for me. Yes, that's it. Okay. Here, open it again. Thank you. I need it to be. All right. 
So I'm going to hold this picture up. I hope it's visible good. It looks like there's a glare. Come here, Moses. Hold this tablet. All right. I'm going to put this paper up. Hold it straight into the camera. All right. I'm trying to see. Turn that lamp off, please. Because I need you to see this picture clearly. And the other one. <clears throat> because I need to know where this glare is coming from. And neither one of those worked. Okay. This is taking longer than I thought. Okay, he's holding it to the side. All right, I'm not sure if you can see that. It's taking a little too long. So let me see if this picture works better. Move that. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the picture instead. Thank you, Moses. Okay, this here is a thriving plant. My son started this from a kidney bean out of the kitchen. And we're going to say that this glass that is in is the brick and mortar church, okay? And this plant, as you can see, beautifully green leaves, it was thriving, right? All right. That's because when it came in, when it started as that little seed, like the babes that come into the church right. building, it needed to be in this environment. It needed that glass. It needed that napkin on the bottom. It needed us to water it each day with a little bit of water so it can get to this point. But we had several of them that we started. And at some point I had to transfer it to some soil, right? because it needed more. It got to the point where it was fed all it could get in that glass, right? It wasn't gonna go any further in that, inside that glass. It was good. Nothing was bad about the glass, right? It was a good thing. It was giving good nutrients to it for a time. So it was an attack on, we should never put it in that glass jar, no. We did the right thing at the right time. But I moved some of them because the roots were growing all out and I planted them outside. Let me show you what happened to the one that didn't move. This is that same plant that I showed you, thriving, looking good, functioning in their church brick and mortar building, right? Being fed by their pastor, thriving, doing good as a spiritual child. But when they became mature and should have been able to feed themselves, and when they were able to hear the voice of God and should have moved out, they stayed. So let me show you what happened when I didn't move it, okay? This is the same exact plant. This is the jar. You see that brown nastiness? Look at it, it can't even stand anymore. Hold this jar for me, Moses. This is that same beautiful thriving plant that when it was time to move out of this environment, it didn't, I didn't move it. So now in order to stand, it needs me. It can't stay on its own, I gotta hold it up. And if I let it go, that's what happens. Hold it again. It should be producing fruit it should be green, but instead it's this. So now I can just, look at that, I just touched it, it came off. This is withering and dying, okay? 
But there's a piece up here on the top that still looks a little green. But I got to get it out of here. I got to move it in order for it to go or else the whole thing will die. Just like that. Thank you. So now I'm going to show you the one that I moved. And I'm going to need both of you to hold this up before the camera. Bring it. I hope that this message is coming through clearly and this visual demonstration is helping you. Okay, bring it over. All right, hold it up. This is the plant that was moved. Closer. Do you see the difference in the leaves? I don't have to hold it up. It's standing. And let me point this out to you. Look at that. Close, close, close. Do you see what this is? It's producing fruit. It's producing after its kind. It's developing. Thank you. And the only reason that's happening is because I moved it. This was supposed to do the same thing, but it stayed too long in the wrong environment. The environment itself was not bad. It was good for a time. So this is what God is pointing out. Pastors, you're having babies come into your ministry. You're training them for a time. Don't hold them back when it's time to release them because they will wither and die if they stay. <clears throat> so what is the message there? If God told you to go, you better shake off every doubt and every contrary feeling and go. You better move out into your calling and grow. The next scripture I'm going to read is one that I incorrectly applied to every believer until the Lord gave me this revelation. And he said it's not for everyone is directed to the harvest. It's Romans 10, chapter 13, chap, Romans 10, verse 13 through 15. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? How many of you have heard that scripture before? Yes. I've heard pastors use it and use it in a way saying, how are you going to hear unless you have a preacher? This is talking to the new, the new, the babies, the newborns, the children that are just learning their father's voice. How are they going to hear? How are they going to call out to him to be saved when they don't know about him? Not those that have already heard. Not those that have already accepted him. Not those that have already matured in the word of God. How are you going to hear without a preacher? You're going to hear because you're going to go in his presence and you're going to hear from him personally. That's how you're going to hear. And this scripture has been misinterpreted by so many Christians. Using it to make mature... My God. To make mature believers handicapped. To make them believe that they can't hear without them. Who does that? 
What scripture did God ever give to say, once you become born again, that I'm not going to speak to you personally. I have to go through someone else. What scripture is that? God is always calling for us to become intimate with him so that he can speak one-on-one -on -one with us. That's his desire. To cut out the middle man. God said this scripture is not for trained, seasoned soldiers. They should be familiar with my voice directly from me. No middle man needed. Do you see that? Yes. You have people. I'm not saying they're doing it on purpose. Maybe they just don't know any better. I don't know what the reason is. But if you're using that scripture to make seasoned, trained, mature saints believe that they can't hear from God without a preacher, that is false. God is speaking directly to his children. You can hear from him. You can hear from him in the bathroom. You can hear from him in the bedroom. You can hear from him walking down the street, in your car, wherever. In these last days, Christ is in need of mature soldiers, not weak babies, that still need to be fed by others in order to move out in what he's called them to. So if you still need someone else to tell you everything, that means you are immature in the body of Christ. And it's time to grow up. Part of the pastor's job is edifying the body to mature the saints. That maturity means that you are hearing directly from God now. You are following his instructions now. So once again, Romans 10 verses 13 through 15 is designed for the harvest. For nurturing and training with the goal of releasing, not holding hostages, and making dead head clones. Wow is right. God said the preparation time is to sit. The assignment time is to go. When he's preparing you, okay, you sit. But once you've been prepared and he speaks to you and it's assignment time, you go. You get up. Now comes the skit. And before I bring them up, I'm going to show you some pictures to illustrate what I was just saying. Now, they had no preparation time for this skit. And... We're just trusting in the Holy Spirit to move and to bring to light everything that needs to be um, revealed through this skit. But I'm going to show you these pictures. Very cute little baby sitting in the high chair, right, being fed by her daddy. Awesome. Very cute, very normal and natural. Let's equate this to a pastor feeding the flock, the babies. He's feeding them, giving them what they need so they can mature. Okay? Now I'm going to flip this over. You see that? I put the words pastor and mature saint. You see that? You have a full-grown adult man sitting in a chair, how natural does this look to you? How healthy? No. Not a bit, right? No. That's the analogy. Mature saint 
still sitting in the high chair, waiting for the pastor to feed them something to nourish them. This is not good. We want to break out of this. This is why, another reason why, God allowed some of these houses to be shut down because guess what? Too many mature Christians sitting in the high chair. Feed me, feed me. I want my bottle. Oh yes, that's what's happening. Don't you dare, the pastor, don't you dare get out that high chair. You know you need me to feed you. What you trying to do? Don't pick up that spoon. Put that down. I got to feed you. Another picture. Here we go. Look at that. Grown man. Sitting in the chair. Got a little sippy cup. And the scripture the Lord gave me for this is Hebrews 5 and 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. When you need to be out there teaching others, you still sitting in that chair year after year after year. Never moving out into your assignment and your calling. Just sit. How much preparation are you going to need to move when God says move? How long are you going to sit when are you going to trust his hand and begin to take those steps of faith? When are you going to get up and go? Get up and go and do what God is calling you to do. Okay. So we have two scenarios that are going to be shown. One is going to be the correct one and one is going to be the incorrect one. So we're going to start off with Scenario one, okay? Now we have the pastor coming up right now. Yes. And pastor, hold up what you have, please. You see his food? This is the word of God. He's nourishing himself with what he needs. He's feeding himself the word of God. He's studying now to show himself approved, okay? So when pastor gets full and he's ready to release to the harvest, okay, you can put that plate down now. And we're going to bring one of the, um, the sheep in now to be fed. Hold, the, hold it, <clears throat> just to show them. Okay? This is a new babe born into the kingdom of God, and he needs to be fed. He needs to be nourished. Pastor, what are you going to feed this baby? The word of God. Okay? Now, we saw what the pastor was eating, right? He has steak and broccoli and asparagus and corn on the cob and all that good stuff. But when the baby comes to him, when the baby comes to him, he's going to feed the baby. Hold the baby. You hold him. Okay, begin to feed the flock. This is what he's giving him. When he comes and sits. This is preparation time. He's nourishing him with the word of God. Okay. Now, this same baby has been sitting in the congregation for a while. And the pastor is still feeding himself, doing what he needs to do. 
He's studying. He's saturating himself in the word. He's setting himself apart to make sure he has what God has for the people. So now, Pastor, you can put that down now. You've prepared yourself for service. And so this baby looks different now. Baby. The baby. The new babe in Christ, he's beginning to get stronger and grow. So this is what he looks like now. Step in. Okay. Oh, wow. He looks different now. He's matured in the word of God. He's, he's looking like he's, he's learning. He's growing. He's learning to hear the voice of God. Okay, pastor. So here you go. This is your plate that you've been eating from, right? Yes. And so now, could you do me a favor? Tell him that you want to eat. That you want to hear the word of God. However the Lord leads you. Remember, they're doing this off the fly. Believing the Holy Ghost to move. He wants to hear the word of God. He wants to hear the word of God. He wants to be fed. Okay. Pastor, what do you want to do? This is what the pastor is eating. Going so he's to going to hold on to his plate. He's going to tell them what to do. Pick up this plate. Tell him he's going to do it. Pick up this plate. Pick up that plate, he told you. To eat. Continue instructing him, Pastor. Now you eat. Eat, and this will nourish you full of the word of God. Make sure you're in the camera. Move closer. It will nourish you and fill you with full of the word of God. That you be a willing service to please God. So Amen. Eat. So eat. Eat. Okay, so we're going to leave them in front of the camera. Both of you hold your plates up, please. Do you see what's happening? This pastor, when this babe came into his flock, he was feeding him with a baby spoon from a bowl. But when this babe began to mature and grow, what he did is he didn't feed him any longer. He said, let me show you how to go get your own plate. Let me show you how to put your own food on it and use the fork so you can train your own self now that you can hear from God on your own and you're eating just like me. You don't need me to feed you any longer because now you are mature. Pick up your plate like me. This is healthy. This is what we want. This is the pastor's job, okay? Feed me, feed me as a baby, yes. Once you mature, go get your plate. Let me show you how to feed yourself, amen? Amen. Okay, put that down. Scenario two. Okay, pastor. You are going to pick up your plate and begin to study the Word of God as you did before. Training yourself, separating yourself, studying to show yourself approved in the Word of God, right? Yes. Okay. So now, we have that same baby coming to you again. You can put your plate down because you're ready to pour out into him. Here's the baby. So, Pastor, this baby needs to be nourished and fed. So what are you going to give him? I'm going to feed him baby food. Amen. He's nourishing him. So he can grow. So he can grow. And after he grows, what is he going to do? Eat meat. Go. And go. And grow. And go. Amen. After he is nourished, he's going to grow and go. All right. So now, Pastor, begin to feed yourself again. Because each time we pour out, we have to put back in, right? So he has to continue to study the Word of God. He has to continuously lay before the Lord 
and hear what the Lord has for the flock that he is responsible for. Okay, Pastor, you can put that down. So, you're going to approach him again and you're going to say that you need to be fed. You want to hear the word. I want to hear the word of God. Okay. I'll so now, you. give him the microphone. I'll feed you. Okay. So now, watch what this pastor does. First this. Put this on him. Don't come in front of the camera yet. <clears throat> and we want you to hold this in your hand and we want you to pick up the bowl pastor and okay step in front of the camera can both of you be seen yes okay here we go this is the uncalled pastor the self-proclaimed pastor the one that's holding hostages instead of training up skilled laborers to be released he asks you to feed him. Go ahead. All right. Feed you this. What's the matter? You're not, what, what? How natural does this look to y'all? Come on, eat. Look into the camera. I love daddy. I love my pastor. I love my pastor. Eat. He feeds me so good. I'm going to stay with my pastor forever because he's awesome. Don't you just love this good food? Don't you dare try to feed yourself now. You hear me? That's right. I'm the one that you need to get you where you need to go. Say that again in the mic, Pastor. What did you tell him? I'm the one that you need to get you where you need to go. Hey, did you hear that? He's training you to need him. He's not pointing you to Jesus. This pastor said, you need him. That's the only way you're going to eat. That's the only way you're going to fulfill your call. Talk to him, pastor. I got the right nourishment, Lord, to get you. But you need to stand on my train. Amen. Be understand that I'm the one who's able to lead you and guide you in the right direction. Without me, you, you want to have a hard time making it. So just continue to listen and grow under me that you may fulfill the will of God. Never leave me. Never forsake me. Never leave your pastor or forsake your pastor. Stay there forever. What, you got anything to say to that? You just gonna stay there and eat what, anything? What would you say to that? If someone told you that you're gonna need them forever, you can't get close to God on your own. And even, no matter how much you grow in God, you just gotta keep eating out that, that bowl. Anything? I don't feel like I'm growing. You don't feel like you're growing. That's right. You feel like something is stunting your growth, right? And the pastor's job is to edify you so that you can grow. So that means he's not doing his job because he's making you feel like you're not growing. You're just stuck. Okay. Amen. That was the demonstration. Y'all did an awesome Awesome, awesome job. Thank you. Wasn't that something to see? Do you see? Is it clear? Those two scenarios. So, that goes back to the title that the Lord gave me. Don't become a faithful church goer. Not to be mistaken with don't listen to your pastor when you're a baby. But when you're mature, God's voice is number one over your pastor, believe it or not. The assignment is not in the house. Move that back some, please. Okay, so the assignment is not in the house. Going to church is not your service unto the Lord. We don't go to church for God. We go to church 
to get fed, to get mature, to get trained, and to leave. Right? Can we establish that clear? Did that demonstration show you and reinforce what the Lord is saying to you this morning? That you don't want to have that bib on. I love my pastor and I'm just he gonna feed me forever. You don't want to be there. You want that pastor that when you came to him and said, I need to be fed, he said, Go get your plate. Let me show you how to feed yourself. That's what you want. Anybody that keeps breaking this out on you, you need to run. Anybody that keep breaking out this little spoon on you, you need to get out. Because you're not growing. And they're not doing their job of edifying you as a pastor. There's another example that the Lord showed me to point out, and it goes back to what I was saying with emotional moves. We're not talking about emotional moving. We're talking about people trained in hearing the voice of God. So it's not for people that go from church to church to church to church to church with itching ears. This is not the message. Not for you. You don't jump around constantly looking for someone with the right baby food. You don't keep moving around so you can stay in the high chair. You have to grow. You can't stay a baby. Jumping from house to house. I'm still a baby. I need to find out who can feed me. What house? Oh, I like him. He, he got some good food. I'm going to go there and let him feed me. Just hopping around. And you have one spiritual father when you were born again. The one who nurtured you. I have one spiritual dad whom I love. And that is Apostle Ernest Leonard. Still benefiting off of the nutrients that he poured into me. Awesome man of God. I have been trained and mentored by other people, but I have one spiritual father. That's it. So, you can't hop around looking for spiritual fathers and jump in someplace and say, that's my spiritual father. You have you, you already been born again. You already been born again. You got one spiritual father. You don't have one over here, one over there. You may have a cousin, an uncle, an auntie, Different mentors, different teachers, but you got one spiritual father. Okay? 1 Corinthians 4 and 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Okay? You don't have many fathers out here. So stop calling everybody your spiritual father, spiritual mother. You got one, okay? When you got born again. You got different instructors, different mentors, different people that make impartations to you, but you have one spiritual father. So when you leave home, a.k.a. the church building, to walk in your assignment, you should have an open door to return to that spiritual father for guidance as needed. Remember what I said before? That those ones that want to hold you hostage and if you leave, they talk about you, right? They better not come back here for nothing, you know? That's not a spiritual father. That's not a pastor called of God. Because when you have a true spiritual father, when you leave out to your assignment and you need to come back, they're waiting for you with open arms to encourage you and continuously covering you in prayer. That's a true 
shepherd. When you have your natural children, how many of you have children and say, oh, I, I, I had this baby and they better not never leave me. If they do, if they leave my house, if they get their own apartment, if they get a job and start working and making their own money, they better not come back to me for nothing. Isn't that horrible? Wouldn't that be bad? And some parents probably do do that, but it's not good. If you are a true shepherd, a true loving parent, son, if you mess up, I'm here for you. Daughter, if you fall, I'm here for you, right? right. Amen. That's how it is, amen. I'm here for you. Yeah, you, you, okay. I trained you. If you feel that it's time for you to step out, I'm supporting you. Come on. I'm encouraging you. I'm covering you. I'm praying that the Lord be with you. And if you have any trouble, come on. Talk to me. I'm here for you. That's a shepherd. So the Lord said to tell my pastors and my leaders, stop handicapping my people and return to making disciples and not dependents. That's a good thing. That's a good word. Stop handicapping God's people and start making disciples instead of dependents. They don't need you to survive. They need God. And if you are following this type of leader, the Lord said, wake up. Wake up. The assignment is always to grow and go. And then you send new babies in to be fed if you came from a healthy house. You don't send them into no unhealthy place to be indoctrinated into an occult, right? You don't send them into places that are not preaching the truth. You don't send them into places that are not walking in the love and the compassion of God. If you came from a good house, if you came from a true spiritual father, then you can send the babes there and say, okay, this is where you go in order to be fed until you are strong enough to leave and get on your assignment for God. Matthew 6, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go. Get out of the high chair and get on your assignment. How many mature Christians listening to this word have been sitting and sitting and sitting for years? Being nourished off a of beech nut, stage one. When they should be eating steak and potatoes. So the Lord said every one of his children must learn to turn the Logos word into a Rima word. In order to fulfill their assignment. So every child that comes in to the body of Christ has to learn how to turn, turn the word logos into rima. There is a secret message in the word just for your particular mission. And you are the only one that can read it and understand it. No one can feed it to you. So in the word of God, once you are trained to turn the Logos word into the Rima word, there is a message specifically for your assignment that only you can hear 
and that only you can understand and no one, not even the pastor, is going to be able to feed it to you. It's coming directly from God because of what he's placed inside of you. So what is the Logos? L-O-G-O-S. That is the word of God. You open the Bible, you begin to read the word. It refers to the total inspired word of God. The literal word that you're reading on the page. Okay? You open the Bible and you begin reading with your natural eyes. This is what you see. But you have to get past that. When you're a baby, you open the book, you're reading the stories. That's what they are, they're stories, right? Right. Spiritual stories. But Hebrews 4 and 12 tells a different story. It says the word of God is alive and is active and is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow and it judges the thoughts and, attack and, and attitudes of the heart. So that moves it from logos. It's no longer just a story that you're reading that you are looking from afar and looking onto. You are becoming part of the story when it becomes Rima to you. You understand? It becomes alive and active. That you're no longer just reading a story, you're finding your place in the story. Because you're a part of it. The word was with God, the word was God. God resides in us. We become one with the word. We become part of this, what we're reading. It's alive. So the word of God is supposed to be more than just read. It has to come alive to you. It has to come alive to us. And that's the Rima word, the spoken word. It refers to a verse or a portion of scripture that the Holy Spirit brings to your attention with application to a current situation or a need for direction. So you're reading it and then all of a sudden it jumps off the page. God is speaking to you personally from his word. And you say, whoa, wow. That's that revelation. That's that rima. Whew. That's me, Lord. I hear you. Oh, he's talking to me. I got to move. I got to move. When you get that rima word, nobody can tell you nothing then. And in that respect, that's a good thing then. That's not like, oh, I know everything. No. In this particular thing, when you get that rima word, you better move. You better move. Because that's God talking to you specifically. He ain't telling it to your uncle. He ain't telling it to your pastor. He ain't telling it to nobody. He told it to you. It's specific. It's a rhema word so that it came alive to you. Matthew 4 and 4. But he answered and said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The bread. When you take the communion, the bread, that's the body of Christ, right? We said the word and God is the same, right? That's the body. That's the bread. We can't live by that alone, just the body. No. We have to get the every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, that spoken word, that rima. So the bread alone is the logos. That spoken word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that's when it becomes the rima word. That's what you have to live on because it said you can't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What is he saying to you in his word? What is he telling you specifically to do that he's not telling anyone else but you? Because you've been created with a specific purpose, right? You are unique. You have a specific calling. So he's going to tell you specific things related to that calling that I can't hear. Only you can. Which means you got to get off the spoon and the beech nut. And you got to get to the steak and the potatoes. Right? If you don't have the word, you are not equipped to live right. Because no matter 
how many good deeds you perform, the only way to Christ is revealed in John 14 and 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So that means you can follow as many roads of you as you want. You can think, you can call him whatever name you want. But there is only one road that leads to God. And can I tell you that road? Yes. Jesus. That's the way. That's the truth. That's the life. That's the only road. No other way. My God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love what the Lord gave me to write, and I'm going to read it just like he gave it to me. He said to tell all the doubters that it is written, it is sealed, it's a done deal, it's finalized contract with no loopholes, it's solid as a rock. Wow. Wasn't that something? This is what he's saying. Jesus is the only way. Whatever you're thinking, whatever you feel, feeling he says it is written it's sealed it's a done deal it's a finalized contract with no loopholes you can't get to him no other way no way no how solid as a rock on the solid rock we stand right all else is sinking sand Jesus, you are the rock. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to read another quote now. And this is from Kenneth Gatman Ministries. And it says, we receive a rima word from God when the Holy Spirit specifically reminds us of a particular Bible verse or promise and drops that word into our hearts. He speaks this word to us in such a way that our heart is filled with faith. How many of us have doubted certain things, but then when that Holy Spirit brings something back, you say, oh, I remember what the Lord told me. And you begin to fill up with faith and say, oh, God, you are not a man that you should lie. Every word that you've spoken is true and not one should return void. I remember when you told me this and it shall come to pass. So now, hey, I'm not worried no more. Jesus, I remember what you told me. That Rima word, it came back to me. The Holy Spirit brought it back to me. Hey, my God. And it filled my heart with faith. This kind of word from God gives us sword power in the spirit realm. It enables us to withstand the mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial attacks against us. And to defeat the enemy. When you speak the word, things change. So another thing about that rima word is when that Holy Spirit brings it back to you. And it drops it in your spirit and that faith rises up. You not only start feeling better, you start to talk better. You start to talk back to the enemy. Oh, no, you won't. No, you don't. Oh, no, I won't. You begin to speak the word then. Whatever he told you. Oh, my God. That's when you develop spiritual power and authority in the spiritual realm. That's when you're raising your sword in the army of God. That's when you're maturing the things of God. Oh, I'm not condemned. I did that. I slipped up. Oh, but I'm forgiven. Thank you, Father God, that you died for my sins. I thank you, Lord God, that you have forgiven me, Lord God. I thank you that you love me and that no one can pluck me out of your hand, Father God. That I belong to you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper in the name of Jesus. That's when you begin to speak those things and cut the head off of those demons attacking you. In the name of Jesus, when you take it from the word. When you take it from that book, but just read it and begin to release it out of your mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't have enough money for certain things, but God said he would never see his seed begging for bread. He will make me the lender and not the borrower, the head and not the tail. 
Begin to speak those rhema words into yourself in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father God. By your stripes I am healed. In the name of Jesus, yes, I feel certain attacks. But by your stripes, my God, I'm healed. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. When you begin to speak the rhema word, as things change. Not when you begin to think the rhema word. Release it out of your mouth in the name of Jesus. So there will be times when you are reading the written word of God. And the Holy Spirit will cause a specific word to jump right off the page. Hallelujah, Jesus. My God. This rhema word from God provides you with a mighty sharp sword in your hand. Hallelujah. The sword of the spirit, right? The sword. That's part of the armor of God, right? You have that. That is an offensive weapon, not only defensive. We don't wait for the attacks of the enemy. We're advancing in the kingdom with the word of truth. Amen? Amen. Yes? Yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. My Lord. Wow. Wow. Reading, studying, and meditating on God's word allows it to work inside of us, producing the necessary changes in our lives. Reading, studying, and meditating, and that's what causes the change. That's what makes it alive. That's what makes it real to us. It doesn't make it real when I just sit and sit and hear somebody speak it to me, it becomes alive and real when I take it into my spirit and release it out of my mouth. That's what makes it alive. So God said, every one of my children must move from this logos to this rhema. You got to move to this rhema realm. You have to. Because that's the only way you can fulfill the assignment that I've called you to. But speaking the word of God that you have meditated and received causes the word to defeat your enemies and change your circumstances. Speaking the word that you have meditated and received causes that word to defeat your enemies and change your circumstances. My God. So I'm going to close with a scripture that the Lord gave me for Moses and for all the youth. And this is what he said, Jeremiah 1. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then I, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. This is what the, you said, Jeremiah. This is the prophet. I want you to get it clear. He said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Right? Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet. So this is what the flesh will have you say. Then said I, ah, Lord, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. This is what the flesh will have you saying when God is telling you, I have ordained you, I have set you apart, I have sanctified you, your flesh will have you saying, but Lord, I can't speak, I'm a child. So, but the Lord said unto me, say not. Don't say I'm a child. For thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command you, you should speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth, in the name of Jesus. Come here, Moses. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Stand right here. My God, my God. Then the Lord said, he, the Lord put forth his hand, touched his mouth. And he said, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Lord is going to speak through you, prophet. The spirit of boldness is going to rest upon you, prophet. You understand? You don't have to be shaken. You don't have to think about Moses. You have to think about the Holy Spirit that's living inside of you. 
You have to stir up the gift that's inside of you and allow God to use you to speak what he gives you. And this is what the Lord is saying to all the youth that are out there, that he has sanctified and called to be a prophet unto the nations, that you begin to rise up and the Lord is going to touch your mouth and put his words in you as you begin to go forth and speak in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. So, that is the conclusion of this message. And summing up everything, God is calling for us to mature. Mature in the word of God so that you no longer need this. No longer need this. That you no longer need this. And that you begin to stand on the Rima word of God that the Holy Spirit has stirred in your belly. Hallelujah. I pray that you were blessed by that word and that it came across as the Lord intended. And as usual, we said the church brick and mortar building is for the harvest. And so we are going to call forth for the harvest right now with the prayer of salvation. So the man of God of this house, of this church gathering of the saints is going to come and lead you in the prayer of salvation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 10, verse 9 to 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto, rest, un, to, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confess is made unto salvation. Hallelujah. So if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that we know God is able to save and heal Amen. all, that you shall be saved in your heart and your mind and soul. Thank you, Jesus. And that you will accept Jesus as your Savior. Amen. And that you will follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that that's the way you can come to God. Yes, yes. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to him but to him. Hallelujah. So, Thank you, Jesus. this is your confession. Take it into your heart, your mind, your soul. And believe that God saved you from eternal death. But now, as, as my wife said, you have to find your house that will nourish and train you in the way you should go. Hallelujah. That the Lord will prepare you to go out and do his work. Amen. I will I thank you. And God bless you.